Presenter today is Nick Johnson. He's the director and lead product development at Breedsafe. He's an, he has an engineering background in automotive HVAC systems expanding over two decades. The focus for Nick has always been to find ways to improve the health and safety of machine operators by manufacturing engineering controls designed to control airborne respirable dust. Nick often advises workplace health and safety and the Department of Mines. Uh, and energy inspectors on HEPA cabin filtration systems, and is also passionate about delivering cost-effective solutions for mining and construction industries. So I'd like to invite Nick to turn his camera on, unmute his microphone, and commence the session. Thank you. Go. Can everybody hear me okay? So somebody can send me a little chat to say yeah. Okay. Right. Hopefully. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you very, very much for uh, making the time to uh, listen to uh, my little presentation here. Um, look, you know, as always, the AIH is, you know, up front and uh, leading the way um, in really helping us to try and, well, ed educate each other um, and then obviously the, 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 the greater public and touch wood, the end users. Um, one of the things that I just wanted to sort of go through today is really um, a breakdown of probably, you know, a lot of the questions I get asked, um, you know, and a lot of times I, I, I forget that I'm working with this uh, product and this industry, um, essentially not 24 seven, but pretty close to that, it, it is my company, um, where um, I take a lot for granted and I forget sometimes to just actually go over and help people to understand the real basics. So, um, and then, and then take them through to the, to the sort of end result of what's actually possible sort of thing. So, so what I wanted to do is I just want to just give you a little bit of a rundown on, on who I am and what I am and, and why I do it the way I do. Um, essentially, yep, engineering background, automotive, pretty much from, from when I left high school, uh, went into automotive, uh, learned air conditioning, learned um, refrigeration, um, did a trade as an auto electrician as well. Um, and that sort of gave me a really good grounding for coming through into really getting a bit of an understanding as understanding of what's required came into the marketplace um, to get really high efficiency um, filtration. I had a really good standing on, or background, should I say, to give me a bit of a, a leg up to understand what I needed to do. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna get cracking um, and start the, the little chat bit. So like I said, look, I'm gonna go through some stuff which is obviously pretty basic to, to a lot of people, um, but you know, there are some other people who they are pretty much having a good look at this right from, from a fresh standing, then it's gonna give them a bit of an idea of uh, what we're doing. So um, I'll start with the basics, operator cabin. Behind me, you can, you can see one here behind me um, in our test chamber, and then um, there's an image there of a, a cat. Uh, drot with an enclosed cabin. So essentially that's an enclosed cabin, air conditioned. Um, it's not air conditioned, they get pretty hot in there or pretty cold, whichever way it is, whichever, whichever environment you're in. So um, that's your enclosed cabin. Um, so that's to start off with. Um, and like I said, look, I'm gonna pop up some slides and I'm just gonna talk my way through it. Um, as was said sort of earlier, look, if you've got any questions, just pop them in the chat. Um, and then when we get to the end there, I'll, um, I'll go back through and we'll answer all the questions as we go. Um, so yeah, look, I'm sure there's going to be a few pop-ups. So just as you're thinking about it, put it in there. It doesn't matter if 10 people ask the same question, we can uh, address the same one as we go through. Okay, here we go. Um, why are we concerned about dust in the cabin? Really basic, um, but really look, as we're going forward, um, first issues started being identified with asbestos back in the day. Um, COPD is the other one that's probably, you know, older term. Um, but as we're going forward now, the, 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 the new real hot topics are really, um, the real hot topics at the moment, I've got to stop looking at the, uh, the chat there, but anyway. Um, the real hot topics, obviously, silicosis, um, and that's crystalline silica. Um, you can see down there in the, in the X-ray, um, ringed in blue, um, essentially the signs of, you know, what the doctors actually see when they do an x-ray of somebody who has silicosis of the lungs, yeah. So essentially a lot of it is really scar tissue. Um, 
that's pretty pretty nasty. You know, we can go into a whole lot more detail and how far we want to go with that. But really, long and short of it is, um, it's from exposure to dust, yeah, um, respirable dust. Um, another thing that I just wanted to touch on as well is um, a lot of the standards and everybody's talking about res respirable crystalline silica. Um, we still have, you know, just regular dust, regular dust, and then we have the variation. So there's different size, sizes. So we, we're talking about inhalable particles, um, which is really going to be your nose, your mouth, and your throat. Yeah. Um, and those are in the larger size range, which is typically above 10 microns. Um, I'll just break it down roughly. Below 10 microns, we consider respirable. Above is an inhalable. Um, so, um, yeah, so we got a bit of a breakdown. So the, the particles themselves can come in different sizes. Yeah. Again, it depends on, on what particle you're looking at. Are you looking at organic or are you looking at non-organic? Um, you know, when you're looking at non-organic, you've got your silica, you've got your asbestos, you've got metals like your leads, etc., um, and all the other bits and pieces that float around with that. Um, then you go with your organic, um, and bacteria, mold, viruses, fibers, um, again, are all um, organic on the organic side of things. So really, at the end of the day, inhalable up here, respirable down there. Okay, this is probably one of my favorite slides, really, for giving people an understanding of really what we're trying to deal with here. Okay, so um, we're looking at the size of, of, of dust and, and the, the, the respirable range. Okay, so in this, in this slide here, what we're trying to do is we, we, we're just showing a study that was done in the US where essentially um, they wanted to see how long it took a dust particle to settle. Okay, so what they did is they, they set up an experiment. God knows how they did it, but it's pretty clever. Um, and what this is, is they did this experiment. Like you, you probably saw um, Newton with the apple, dropped the apple, and it, that, that's where gravity came from. Okay, so what we're talking about now is we're looking at, at the, the, the particle sizes. So we got a, um, a 20 micron particle. Yeah, which is, you know, for us, you know, it's twice, twice the diameter of a strand of hair. Um, you're looking at 3.6 minutes for it to drop from 1.5 meters to the ground. Okay. So even that in its own right is, is quite a long time. Um, then you start dropping down and you look at the one micron or the 0.5. Yeah. So one micron takes 12 hours to settle. Okay, so that's settling in a still environment. So you just letting gravity do its thing over time. So that's with no airflow whatsoever. It takes 12 hours for a one micron particle to, to, to drop down to the ground. Then you go to a 0.5, so that's half the size, yeah, and it's 41 hours, yeah. So um, I think it's, it's one of the things that I think is probably the the thing that I think is most misunderstood. Essentially, you'll have a lot of uh, issues where, oh look, what we've done is we've we've done a clean out and then we've done a clean down, a clean down, and we came back after smoker. Yeah. Now, essentially, after smoker of half an hour or you know long smoker an hour, yeah, it's made no difference whatsoever. So whatever you're testing in in the airflow uh, or in in, in the, the airstream is still going to be there. Um, and then we'll just go on. Um, so yes, I've. First, first poll, um, we're just going to ask the question. So we're talking about the one micron particle size there. Um, so the question is there, one, mic one micron particle size at the breathing zone, um, does it have a 100% chance to penetrate the lung? Okay, so it's a true or false answer, yeah? So essentially, if, 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 if I have a one, one micron particle here, right, and I'm breathing and it's in my breathing zone, is it going to go into my lungs? Yes. Or no, true or false. So I've got to, I'm watching over here and seeing, yeah, it's 50 50. Yeah, so um, I'll give you a clue. It's pretty, um, it's pretty scary once you actually know the answer. <laughs> so there we go. Okay, so I think that's pretty much everybody gone through there. So we've got, yeah, a couple of changes there, but anyway, I'll move on. Okay. Long and short of it is, if we have a one micron particle in the breathing zone and you breathe it in, it's going to go into your lungs and it's never going to come out. Okay, so um, that was a study done back um, overseas again, yeah, and they're looking at um, that the, the the one 
one micron size. So you got to admit that's got to be pretty scary. Yeah. So when everybody's talking about particle counts in the airstream or in the breathing zone, um, you start looking at those size particles and then obviously you've got one micron, which essentially now in the scheme of things is, is quite a large particle. Um, if it's in your breathing zone, you're going to breathe it in and that's it. It's in and it's done. So that's your silica and your DPM, um, as well as your, your, your range of fibers, fibrous materials or whichever way you want to call it. Um, on our left hand side here, another little slide there, just giving a bit of an idea. Um, this is one that we use when we um, talk to operators, just to give them a rough idea of what size particles we're talking about. So if you look at the, the strand of hair and then you've got 2.5, uh, strand of hair being 10 microns as a diameter, and then you can go down there. So really, you know, we, we are really, really looking at the small sizes here. Yeah. Again, I'll probably keep saying this time and time again, please don't forget about, you know, it's also the bigger sizes that we're worried about. That's the enhanced size. Okay, so damage to the lungs. So essentially these, especially the silica particles, they're going into the lungs. If you imagine them as a glass shard, yeah, or um, a whole lot of razor blades, but razor blades will eventually break down over time if they're that small. But um, if you imagine like a whole glass shards into your lungs, um, your body's gonna try and protect you. Yeah, um, and it's going to try and grab that, dissolve it, destroy it, do whatever it's got to do to get it, you know, to make it safe. So when we're talking about, we're looking at the x-rays, we're always looking at scar, scar tissue. Yeah, um, and essentially that's the scary thing is essentially once these particles go in, we know that they're not going to come out. Yeah, they can't be cleaned. That's it. You know, there's, there's talk of ways of looking at doing that, but it's not really widely available. Um, the thing that we sort of got to always, always keep in mind as well is, you know, we've got exposure, yeah, and then um, people go, oh, look, you know, it's fine, I'm going to be doing this, this, this dirty job for a while, and then, uh, or I'm only doing it for three months, I'm a casual or whatever, and then I don't have to worry about it sort of thing, I won't be exposed to that sort of stuff. Essentially, these little glass shards are just sitting there, just damaging, 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 yeah. Um, again, there's a a lot of studies going backwards and forwards on which is worse and, and how it all compounds, etc. But whichever way, you know, you really don't want to get them into your lungs in the first place. That's the ideal. Yeah. Um, this, this slide, I look, I, I, I sort of, I like this one here really, because what it does is essentially it just says to people when they, when they're doing their studies on site, you know, um, you can come back and go, oh, no, our site's fantastic. It's great. Yeah, it's really good. Look at the study. You know, we had, we had uh, really, really low levels over here. But if you look at the side, on the, on the right-hand side there, you can see the, uh, all the green lines. Um, and on the left-hand side, you can see all the red, you know. I'm going to point out the obvious here. Which way do you think the wind's blowing? Yeah. So um, it's something to keep in mind that really, look, whenever we're looking at dust, we've got to really stand back and look at the big picture. Yeah, um, a lot of what we do here, um, and the more we get, the more I know, the more I feel I don't know, um, and the more I understand that one size does not fit all. Yeah, um, you've got to be really mindful about what you're dealing with um, as you go through there. Um, we've got all the different sites here landfills, demolition, construction, quarries, foundries, ports, tunnels, roadworks, agricultural, even down to your guy clearing the house pad. Yeah, um, they're all disturbing. They're all disturbing the overburden. Um, some of Central Queensland's overburden is, is classed at sixty percent silica. So um, yeah, it's pretty. You know, not all dirt, not all dust is the same. Yeah. Um, okay, let's start looking at some some sort of controls that we, we we're looking at here. Um, I'm not going to read all the fine print because essentially I think a lot of it is pretty straightforward. Um, I'm going to be repeating myself if I do that all day long. But really we're looking at RS14 and RS20, probably the most current sort of standards that we're talking at the moment. Um, and as we go through, you'll see that there's a lot of standards, either the European standards, um, North American standards, South American standards, um, and then obviously our own Australian standards, all pretty much coming back to the same sort of um, agree agreement at the end of it, that they're all pretty much saying the same thing now. So um, number one, dust sealed operator cabin, yeah? Now, so many, so many people take it for granted, assuming that because a cab has windows and air conditioning, it's dust sealed, yeah? Um, essentially, you know, there's probably two that I can, I can put my finger on that are actually what I would call 
effectively dust sealed, okay? All the rest pretty much are not, you know, even down to light vehicles. Like some of the, the light vehicles that we do are actually the hardest systems that we have to install because their sealing is so poor, yeah? Um, and really, if you want an effective system, you've got to have a dust sealed operator cabin, okay? Um, with saying dust sealed, I've got to sort of say to you as well as, look, we've got to keep in mind that um, it's not a sealed environment, okay? We can't have a sealed environment or people are going to pass out. So it's what we call effectively sealed. Um, and with this effectively sealed, we're going to have a HEPA um, filter for the fresh air intake, okay? This is one of the sort of the, the breakdowns of what we're talking about is Essentially, there's two, two, forms of, two forms of filtration. One is the fresh air, and two is the recirculation air, okay? So fresh air is what was traditionally where they mounted a pressurizer on the outside and blew air inside, okay? So that's the pressurizer, or that's fresh air in, and then recirc is the inside side of things. I'll go into a little bit more detail as we go along. Um, then again, down in the statements, we've got pressurized operator cabin. So you use the pressurizer for the fresh air to make the pressurized operator cabin. And then you need a di display of some sort to just tell the operator everything's working okay. Um, this is a little bit of an audit that we did um, just not too long ago, um, giving you a bit of a rough breakdown of, of the standards there that we're talking about. So on the left-hand side, we've got unit. Then we've got the model, so it's a Komatsu WA900. Um, then we're talking about the fresh air. So that's the, the part number for the filter there. So we know that's a HEPA H13 at the time. Uh, we've got the recirculation filter. Then we've got maximum cabin pressure preset, which is 50 pascals, another discussion that we'll have as we move forward. Um, PM count, yeah, and then we've got uh, the actual hours for the vehicle and, and whether it passed or failed. Okay, so. As I go through, I'll give you a little bit more detail and then you can refer back to the slides at, at your own time um, when, when you get a chance. Now, really what we're looking at there is we're looking at um, the fourth line down is essentially where we're looking at for RS20 now, okay? So we're going to have a HEPA fresh air pressurizer, yeah, a HEPA return air filter. We've got cabin pressure that's over 300 on uh, full speed. We've got a preset of 50 PM count practically zero, and that's a micrograms per, per cubic meter. Um, I'll say practically zero, even though it reads zero there, you know, because essentially as soon as you've got the thing started and running and vibrating, it's not going to be zero, okay? So, um, but really that's that's where we're aiming. That, see that green line? That's exactly where we're aiming. Um, there's products there on this one site where they've got different variations, but they don't have everything that we need for the RS20. Okay, so again, going back to sort of real, real um, basics again. Um, what's actually on these machines at the moment? Okay, so here's one, Komatsu D275X, right? Um, that's the filter that's in it. Okay, now when we're talking about efficiencies and we're talking about HEPA, we're talking about you know particle sizes of below 10 microns. This filter here won't stop anything pretty much below 50. Yeah, um, and the only time it might stop it is when it's blocked. So therefore, it's not filtering anyway, okay? So the thing that, again, where people get a little bit sort of um, misled, this filter has actually been placed there just to provide some sort of protection for the HVAC air conditioning system, okay? It's not there for air quality, okay? It's just purely to provide a level of filtration that's not too resistive for the air conditioning. Um, on this machine, you can see there as well on the right-hand photo, we've got a damaged door seal. You know, so again, a lot of the stuff that we'll be talking about going through is, is what I'd like to think is common sense. Um, you know, that's going to be not ideal. And that will be one of the reasons why we'll get low cap and pressure on our maximum speed tests. Um, next one. Number of times I have people say, oh, we've got one of these. It's really well pressurized. It does a right job. It's got a, a gauge on it, et cetera, et cetera. And we don't have any problems. Okay. Um, here's a OEM system fitted to, to the yellow and black machine. Um, I just say to people, look, the best way to work out whether you've got a problem or not, open up the pressurizer, pull the filter out, put your finger in, yeah? If you've got dust on your finger, that's well above 50 microns, okay? So that means that filter there is not doing anything for your respirable dust, you know? It's the sort of touch test. You know, and pretty much every single person who does it goes, oh, I see what you mean now. Yeah. Um, again, the efficiency of the filter, same as an engine filter, will get better as it gets more clogged. 
Problem is, the more clogged it gets, the less air it's filtering, they change it and you're back at square one again, okay? Um, again, you know, absolute sort of telltales, yeah? So these two photos on the left here are showing OEM filters. The one second from the um, second in there doesn't even have a seal on the filter, yeah? Um, really, you know, low efficiency, um, just really just there to do something. Yeah, there's a photo of a vent there. Um, now, probably anybody who goes out and has a look at um, any machines working on a quarry or a mine site, yeah, that they would have seen this before. And they go, that's weird. So there's a filter here, right? I can see the filter. And how come there's dust at the vent? Yeah, just a low grade filter, that's all it is. Then we go across here, here's a machine. Perfect example, low grade uh, OEM filter working in an extreme environment. The dust just goes straight through it into the air conditioning, um, winds up blocking the air conditioning, then the operator actually opens the door or the window because the air conditioning doesn't work. What else are they supposed to do? It's too hot in here, it's too cold in here, whatever it is. Um, again, you know, it's sort of the, the lack of filtration that leads to the operators doing the wrong thing, then you, you sort of, you really are chasing the tail. Um, below there is a photo of a, um, a machine working in a cement uh, clinker shed that has one of our systems on. Um, and look, essentially when I say one of our systems, it, it's, a, it's a dual HEPA filtration system. So all the air going through the HVAC system has been filtered through a HEPA filter. So the filter catches the dirt, not the air conditioning, and then not the operator's lungs, yeah? Um, or, or should we say up in the higher side there, you know? So look, you know, people might say to you, oh look, you know, it's, it's expensive, it's this, it's that, it's the other. That's absolute nonsense, yeah? It is not at all, right? Every single customer that's done a trial and worked out, hang on a second, yeah? If I put this system in, um, we keep our HVAC um, clean, which means that it keeps on working. Middle of summer, we're not standing machines down because the aircon's not working and changing parts, and then hopefully, you know, everybody puts it back together properly and it, and it, uh, and it works again afterwards. We don't have any reliability issues. Um, so yeah, look, it's vitally, vitally important. Like I say, that photograph bottom right is a, a excavator working in a cement clinker shed. The worst environment I've ever seen in my entire life, okay? Um, so then I'll scroll on. Okay, so we're talking about really small dust, okay, right? How do we catch it? You know, why do we need HEPA filters, okay? So really, in the scheme of things, a lot of the testing is all done around 0.3 of a micron. The reason why, it's the harder size particle to catch, okay? Small is easier than, than, than 0.3 of a micron, okay? So in the scale on the left-hand side here, you can see the, how the particle works, right? So essentially, these particles are small. They're not really governed by inertia, gravity, or whatever. They, they can do their own thing. Sometimes they will go with the airflow, sometimes they won't. So there's four main principles on how the particles get caught. Then you, on the, on the right-hand side, we're showing those fibers are actually the filter fibers, and then you can see the dust particles on those fibers. Now, if you look at those, you can see, hang on a second, there's particles on the front and the back, yeah? And the best way it was described to me is if you imagine that those fibers are actually sticky, yeah? And anything just glances past them, they stick to it. And that's the whole idea of what we're working on here. So um, when we're looking at catching these respirable particles, it's got to be HEPA, yeah? Um, because essentially that's the only way that you're going to get the highest efficiencies out there. Um, okay, poll number two. What is the integral efficiency of an H14 filter? 99.97, 99.99, or 98.99? Yeah, this is, this is really what we're talking about here, is efficiencies of the filter media. It's really, really, really um, one of the things that I'm probably the most pedantic about is, look, essentially, we know that any exposure to respirable silica, DPM, just any respirable dust is going to be harmful to a degree. Yeah, so my, my chain of thought is essentially, look, if it's harmful, yeah, well, why aren't we aiming to get 100% out of it, yeah? That's got to be the aim, is to go for it, to, to really try and get as much as we can out, yeah? Um, it's a bit of a trick question here, because I'm talking about H14 filters as opposed to H13 filters, so I'm giving people some, some clues there. Um, 
So yeah, look, um, what we're trying to do here is catch everything. You know, if we're going to put a system in, let's just aim for everything. Yeah. Um, so I think we've pretty much got everybody on it. And I'm glad to see that the majority of people have got it right. So it's answer B, which is 99.99. Okay. Um, and here we go. Right. So age 14. Yeah. 99.995. Okay. Um, and this is to, to, to particle size of 0.3 of a micron. Yeah. Um, Again, this is something I sort of, I'm going to touch on again, is essentially on the table on the left-hand side, at the bottom there, you've got the diameter of the, um, the particle size, okay? So in between 0.1 and 1, somewhere around there, you've got 0 0.2 to 0.7 of a micron, 0.3 is usually sitting somewhere in the middle there, okay? Um, and those are the hardest ones to, 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 to catch, okay? Right? So if you see there, below one micron, they start actually getting easier to catch again, okay? So this is, this is the thing that I, I sort of highlight to people is look really, you know, we're talking about 0.3, but really we're talking about all the way down the scale, yeah? And as that filter really starts doing its job and you get the airflow as low as possible, it will become more efficient again, okay? So um, there's some little tricky bits in there. Um, one of the things I'd like to point out here, right, is there's been a change of classification, yeah? So HEPA filters used to be called um, H11, H12, and then H13. Now they've changed that classification to E11, E12, and then, then it becomes HEPA grade, okay? So there's a couple of changes in there because essentially if you look at the E11, it's actually 95, which is the same as your um, P2 respirator. Okay, um, there's another thing I just want to touch on as well, is that when we are talking about HEPA filters and efficiencies, I've highlighted it down in yellow here, right? We've got to know that they've been tested to a standard that is actually reliable, okay? So there's the standard that, that pretty much most companies and most organizations now work to is EN 1822, which is about how to test HEPA filters, okay? And what is a HEPA filter, okay? Now, in that standard there, you can have what they call electro-charged, um, electro, <laughs> electrostatically charged filter media, okay? So what they'll do is they'll take a lower grade of media um, and they'll charge it and then it actually becomes charged. So any particles actually attract the um, particles to it. The problem with that is, like anything charged, it will actually lose its charge. So yes, it starts off really efficiently and it will be at your H13, no problem at all, yeah, right? But then pretty much after, say, two weeks or so, you're probably gonna be not even E10, okay? Now, um, if you start then introducing moisture, you're lucky if you get a couple of days out of it, okay? So there's a couple of little quirky things in there. Um, but really look, you know, look for the standards. So next one again, we're talking about the standards. Um, first one really to come out was actually the guidance for power stations, yeah? So there it is, enclosed cabins with windows closed at all times, high efficiency air filtration, HEPA filters, uh, intake and recirculation. So that's both fresh air and recirculation. Um, so that's the key thing that we're always looking at. Um, Again, keeping personal uh, vehicles dust sealed and pressurized, yeah? So the sealing pressurized, they always run hand in hand. Then we've got RS20, you know, the, uh, obviously our latest one that we're all working to at the moment now. Um, effective cabin sealing, again, right? I, I'll say it time and time again, that is always gonna be our number one. If we don't have effective cabin sealing, even, even with no system on at all, you're, you'll actually dramatically increase your respirable inside there. Okay. Um, Again, minimum HEPA age 13, 99.97%, and we got the age 14, which is 99.99, okay? Um, I've gone to age 14 because look, you know, look, there's a couple of other benefits. It's a different type of media, which gives you a better dust loading capacity, so that the filter will actually last longer, but obviously it's also a better grade. Um, New one here, cabin pressure display with low pressure warning. So now we're actually asking for some sort of a system in the cab to warn the operator that it's not working right, there's a problem, okay? So we've got no pressure, okay? Uh, no pressure, low pressure, there's a problem with the system, whatever it is. HEPA return air, um, and that's where we start talking about the secondary side of things. Um, next thing we're coming on to is how do you clean the cabin, and that's gonna be with a HEPA vacuum cleaner. So H-class, that's where we gotta go. Um, 
yeah, we can talk about brushes and stuff, but let's not go there. Um, where did all of that really come from? Um, we, we, we sort of, you know, always pretty much where we can. We go back to EN 15695, European standard essentially for agricultural equipment. But really it came in when they were talking about sort of pesticides, plowing, farmers, lung, crop dusters, you know, the, the, the sort of either European or, or North America. Um, they've all got terms for, for farmers having some sort of lung disease. Um, and that's where really EN 15695 Park came from. Um, the two, the two, the two categories that we're looking at really is category three, category four. Category three is for um, dust and vapor protection, and category four would be for dust, vapor, and gas. Okay, um, something that probably you know, look, it's, it's just something to keep in mind. Um, some mine sites that you may be working with will have reactive uh, soil. Um, landfill sites will have uh, VOCs, um, you've got foundries, etc. Then you're looking at a category four system, not a category three. Okay, so then you want to be targeting gas as well. Um, so those are the two really that do come into play uh, with what we're talking about here is, is dust and vapor and then dust, vapor, and gas. Okay. Um, okay, RS20, what exactly is it? Okay, so what you need for, for RS20. Look, this is obviously my product. I put my hand up. There's other products out there. Um, you need a, a cabin pressurizer, okay? So, so traditionally, in the, in, back in the day, essentially, it was an engine grade filter and a blower motor, yeah. Um, then when, you know, the, the budget allowed, they put a, put a pre-cleaner on there, yeah, to give us a little bit more pre-cleaning. Um, so the filter lasted a little bit longer. Really, Back in the day, or even up to a couple of years ago, and even now, some machines go out. They don't have any sort of a monitor on there at all. Okay, so they might have some sort of a pressurizer fitted on the outside, but they don't have any sort of a monitor on there at all. Okay, um, now we know that we're talking with a hazardous substance here. We know that for a fact. So we need to know that whatever engineered solution we put on that piece of equipment, we need to know it's working. And really, the only way to know that is essentially with some sort of a cap and pressure monitor, okay? Um, the pressures we're talking about are so low, below PSI, yeah, you can't detect it, yeah? Um, and, and, you know, look, yeah, I'm yet to find anybody to, who can. Um, so essentially what we're all going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at our pressurizer. Ideally, your pressurizer should have some sort of a, a pre-cleaning arrangement. Now, this is to take out our big stuff and hopefully the majority of our... Um, are inhalables, yeah. Um, so centrifugal, top spin, Donaldson, Cyclone, pre cleaners, whatever. There's, there's quite a few of them out there, but you want one of them in there, and that's just to get rid of your big stuff. Then you're going to have your blower assembly. Then you're going to have your HEPA H13, touch, touch wood H14, which is what we've moved to now. Um, I just noticed that our slides off. But anyway, um, then we've got cabin uh, pressure display. Um, and as you can see there, under the three there, we've got 51 pascals, yeah, um, and then we've got underneath that, we've got what we call a full speed test, okay? So essentially, um, majority of sites at the moment ask us to set our systems to, to maintain 50 pascals of pressure, okay? Um, EN15695 says, look, essentially, if you've got a display, it only needs to be over 20, because all we want is more in here than out there. That's what we're aiming for. Okay, um, but if there's a problem, we need to know about it, and that's where the display comes in. So you can drop your pressure and and go there. We we actually go with the lower the pressure, the better, and I'll go into that uh, at a later stage. Um, but yeah, look, really, that is really really important. Um, and then next to that, we've got our HEPA return air filter. So we've got a photo down here. Um, I think that might be. Uh, so it's, it's a wheel loader, certain brand. Um, so all we do in there is we're just taking the OEM filter off and we put in our filter on there. Now, um, this is this is a, a system that we developed. If you were at the show at the Gold Coast, at the Hudson Safety Show at Gold Coast last, last year, yeah, um, you might have seen our, our little display there. So it's a Toyota Hilux. Essentially, this has got three stages of filtration, yeah. Um, it's got the fresh air pressurizer, bottom right. Then it's got what we call a recirculation air scrubber, yeah. Um, so that draws the air from the cab, cleans it and pumps it back into the cab again. Um, and then to look after the operator and the HVAC system, we've replaced the OEM 
return air filter in the aircon system in the dashboard with a HEPA filter. Okay, so the three stages, purely because we can't cut into the front of the machine or the vehicle, because essentially if you cut it, you own it. It's a um, five-star rated cab. If you cut a big three-inch hole in it, it's not a five-star rated cab anymore. Um, so yeah, one thing to keep up, uh, an eye on. The reason why we've got this slide here is essentially what I'm doing is just showing you the pull down. Okay, so we jumped into a machine. This is obviously a, a study that we've done ourselves. Jumped into a machine and we've, um, Started it up, you can see our counts right up high on the left hand side, and then we're down to within four minutes, we're down to uh, practically zero. Yeah, if we this was using a return air filtration system on the HVAC system, if we were to add a scrubber, we're more than half that pull down period. Okay, so it's not that it, it does it any better, it just does it quicker each time you open and close the door. So when you're talking about drill rigs, etc., where they're pulling the door open and closed as they go through, then maybe that's something to look at. Um, here we've got our activated carbon system, very, very similar, just an extra stage of activated carbon. Um, I'm just looking at the time here. Um, this is probably, if you take away anything from everything whatever I've said to you today, this is, the, this is the slide to take away from it, okay? So essentially, everybody's used to seeing these around, okay? So protection factor, if fit tested and fitted well properly and not like that, like that, yeah, 10-ish, um, somewhere around there, okay? So most sites think that, yeah, look, you know, you're sitting in an aircon cab, so you're okay, just chuck one of these on, you'll be right, yeah? Um, protection factors of around 10, 15, somewhere around there, yeah? Um, at very best, yeah? Now on the right hand side here, again, NIOSH study, yeah? Um, they've done underground, which is really good because essentially, yeah, look, we've got a high, higher, way higher um, concentration underground. So we've got a face drill and we've got a, a roof bolter, okay? So on the left hand side there, we can see the little cluster of uh, red and blue, uh, no final filter used, okay? so. Essentially what they're doing is they're, they're putting a um, HEPA fresh air pressurizer onto the machine, yeah, and then they did the test, okay? And then they got protection factors of 10, 15, and you think, oh, shit, that's good, yeah, great. Then they, they added the secondary filter into the system, okay? On this study, they actually used a, um, a scrubber, so it was another fan force system, okay? Now, you see the, the, the really good improvement there, but look at the scale on the left-hand side. It goes one ten hundred thousand ten thousand. Okay, so if you look at that that face drill, yeah, that protection factor was close to ten thousand. Whereas before, without the return air filter, you were looking at about fifty odd. Yeah, so that's an increase of one hundred fold. Yeah, so that's obviously look. If we're going to do this, let's do it right. Um, okay. Pressure control, yeah, this is one of the things, again, that, that, that I believe is really vitally important, okay? The slower the velocity of the air throw through the head to filter, the more efficient it's gonna be, yeah? So that's that's what I believe, that's what NASA believe, okay? So down here, they've just got a scale showing, yeah, um, essentially, same size particle, the only difference that they've done, same size particle, same filter, the only difference is the velocity of the air going through the filter. Yeah, so we, we strongly believe, um, and look, obviously, our, 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 our own personal analysis test and that confirm that, look, this is the way to go. Um, keep the airflow as low as possible. How do we do that? Well sealed cabin, set the, the cabin pressure as low as possible. Um, okay, With, once we've got the effective system in there, we've got the fresh air pressurizer on there, and then we've got the um, the fresh air pressurizer on there, we've got the research system in there, whether it's a, um, a filter on the HVAC or whether it's a scrubber. Uh, where's our dust and dirt going to be coming from? It's going to be coming in through the operator, yeah? Um, anybody who's seen any sort of mobile equipment, look at the floor, you know where it's coming from, yeah? Um, this is a perfect example, yeah? So essentially, operator left the door open, jumped in, slammed the door, you got a spike there three times the alarm limit, you know? Um, Essentially, yep, the system jumped in and pulled it down, but look, let's try and get away from that wherever we can. Um, this, this is, we, we call it secondary, uh, secondary exposure because essentially it's not really in the line of sight that people see coming, yeah, because they think, oh, okay, look, we've got a hyper pressurizer, we've got the research system on, we're all good to go, okay? Problem is that the operators have walked around across the site, they've got their, their, their long trousers on, really dusty site, it's just completely saturated their clothing. Um, they jump in, turn the aircon on, it blows the dust off their clothes, 
up into their breathing zone, yeah? Now that's the stuff that we're really trying to get hold of. Most systems, thankfully, um, most systems, thankfully, have uh, the return air filter down at ground level. Um, so essentially, the, 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 the flow of the airflow is going to be coming from top down, which is exactly what we want, okay? Um, next thing, obviously, on sites, it's not just the mobile equipment that we're looking at. Um, there's plenty of control rooms sitting in exactly the same environment. Um, they just happen to be static, yeah? Um, no difference, absolutely no difference. It's just a really big enclosed cab. It's not, there's no difference to that whatsoever. Um, so here's one here where we've got a, a control room on a quarry and, you know, you just jump in, you can see gaps everywhere, you know? So essentially the only thing that's doing any degree of filtration is actually the, um, the, the evaporator coil and the AC unit, which is not, it's a fly screen, it's not a filter in any way. Um, here's a photo of really the way to go. Um, so we've got two units there on the right hand side. So we've got the black unit, which is a fresh, fresh air filtration into the uh, cabin to give us positive pressurization. And essentially that stops any more dust getting in there. Now just keep in mind as well, you've got to keep in the back of your mind as well, this, you know, most places that we're talking about are going to be hot. So they've got aircon. Yeah. As the aircon's uh, working, it cools the, the room down, drops the pressure. So you always need something making up that pressure because you're always cooling it. Okay. So that's why you always need a fresh, uh, a fresh air pressurizer. Then the little gray unit next to it on the left hand side, that's what we call our research unit. So that's drawing air from ideally underneath the operator's boots. Okay. So where the operator's um, sitting is where we put a little grill in the floor and we draw from there. So we want clean air coming in the top dropping down over the breathing zone and then being sucked out through the floor, be re-cleaned and come back around again, yeah? Now that's what we find is by far the most effective way of keeping the breathing zone completely clear, okay? Um, testing old and new, okay? Um, look, we all know the options are in the past, but we believe that real-time monitoring is really gonna be the way to go. And if you want to couple it with a camera, straight away you can see exactly what's happened you know um every single one of the tests and trials we've done whenever we've had some sort of a quirk or an issue as soon as you look at the footage you go oh, you know why they do that that's crazy um next thing as well with these real-time particle counters you can actually see the distribution of particle size um this is something that i think is going to be, become a lot more popular moving forward is looking at particle sizes and understanding the particle size in the environment that that machine or that operator is working at um, it's there, it's available, so easy to use. You can just jump in and away you go. Um, here's a, an audit we did. So again, we're looking at putting in a, uh, an engineered solution and then what we wanna do is we wanna make sure in six months, 12 months, 18 months, five years, it's all working okay, right? Dead easy to do, yeah? You've got a particle time, real time particle counter, jump into the cab, um, turn it all on, start everything up, run it, see what's coming out the vent. Yeah, perfect example here. Here's a, a CAT 980 wheel loader working in a quarry. Just, you know, we, we just uh, got asked to just pop in and just double check, just to make sure everything's okay. Um, pretty much opened the door and looked at the cab. We knew everything was okay, yeah? Because essentially look at the, the cab dash on there. It's absolutely spotless. And this, this is a, um, this machine's probably about nine years old, yeah? Uh, quarry wheel load at nine years old, look at the condition, right? Then jumped in, turned everything on, slammed the door, because essentially us as people inside there can, can really cause some issues with regard to um, particle counts um, and just left it running and there we got it. So we, we're looking at the mass concentration and that's that's reading micrograms, not milligrams, okay? So we've got zero, zero, zero in there coming out the vents into the breathing zone. Our system's working like an absolute dream. Yeah, um, and this is one thing as well that I, I think as we move forward, it's gonna be something to keep in mind. It's, it's really when we're doing the audit, what we're looking at, we're looking at, okay, one, uh, the fresh air filter, is it a HEPA filter tested as per 1822? Yes, no. If it is tested per 1822, it will have a serial number. Let's make a note of the serial number. Um, has it got a HEPA return air filter in there? Let's have a look at it. Yes, it does. Uh, turbo pre-cleaner, you know, um, because essentially, look, we, 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 we are working in really quite dust-laden environments, so we want to make sure that we can provide the best pre-cleaning that we got available. So we need some sort of pre-cleaner on there. It doesn't have to be a turbo, some sort of pre-cleaning system on there, not just essentially a, a canister with, a, with a, an inlet, you know. Um, 
digital cap and pressure display. As I said, we need to make sure that that solution is working, right? Um, cap and pressure above 20 pascals, okay? I'm going back to what we recommend, which is above 20. You can have it, there's a couple of sites now that have moved to 30 pascals, uh, dropped down from 50 to 30. Uh, visual alarm um, and an option of a buzzer as well. So that becomes a bit more popular now is to have a visual red LED, the, the show up on a display and then um, uh, a buzzer as well. Um, again, now we're looking about the serviceability of the system, so we need to make sure that, that that system, when installed, will do a service period. And the way to work out that is to know that if you've got really good cabin seating, you're going to be able to get really good pressure on startup. Okay, so on startup with everything installed and everything, you should have over 250 pascals of pressure in the cab. Yeah, I think earlier on in one of those slides that we had 700 on. Yeah, look, you don't, you can maintain 700, great, but you don't need it. So let's drop that down to 20 um, and then to maintain the 20. I've got fresh air factors connected. Yeah, a number of times I have a few people say to us, oh, look, um, yeah, we're just going to change the filters and da da da. You've got a fresh air flap inside the HVAC system. What it does, it turns off the fresh air inlet to the cab and stops what they call bleed pressurization. Yeah, which means you just suck dirt in from everywhere. So again, that fresh air flap has to be disconnected. And then we've got the real time dust test, and that's using whatever real time particle counter you want to use um, to just test, test what's actually coming out at the vent. Again, you've got to be mindful that we want to make sure that. We got the engineered solution, but is it actually working on that piece of equipment? Yeah, and that's where we come in. Um, again, one of the biggest things that's gonna drive air quality inside the cabin is actually the operator, right? And I'm, when I say biggest, I think it's 99% of, of, of getting good air quality is the operator. They gotta know what you're doing, yeah? Um, here's just a, a, a test done. You can see the operator leaning out the door, go back in again. You've got uh, door closed, door open. Massive differences, you know? Um, so just, Absolutely insane. This is always a, a pulse that I really like. The bottom left hand side, I thought, what's that little bucket for? Yeah, because we had some alarms with our, our, our data recorder in there saying that they were operating the machine with the door open. What was actually happening, it was actually on a quarry here in Queensland where the operators knew that they could keep the cab absolutely spotless. So what they were doing is they were actually jumping into the cab, taking their dirty boots off, putting them in a bucket and putting clean boots on to operate the machine so they don't get any dirt on the floor. Yeah, um, so what I'm trying to sort of highlight here is once people understand that it can be done, yeah, um, you can have a spotless clean cab. And if you look around the bucket there, you'll see it's spotless, absolutely spotless. Um, it can be done. So that's it, I'm afraid to say. So we've um, jumped in there right at the end there. I um, rattled off at the end there quickly just to get to the end so I can have some time for some questions if anybody's got any. Um, so yeah. Um, does anybody have any questions? Um, so, one of them's coming through from Christopher. Yeah. Uh, can you use a filter system below HEPA and still achieve? Um, the okay, so when, you, when you're talking about um, a filter system below HEPA, you're not going to be targeting respirable heart particles, okay? And that's where your drama comes in, you know? And that's probably one of the questions I, I do get asked quite a lot. But the issue that you're looking at is you're trying to measure something that's so small, yeah, it really, talking about measuring by weight with respirable dust is, is you know, it's like, I, I don't believe it. I, I believe as we move forward, it's going to be particle count. You know, how many particles have we got in this size range below 10 microns is what people are going to be looking at, yeah? Because essentially, yeah, look, you, you can get rid of a lot of, it comes down to, I also mentioned as well, is you, you can use a lower grade and, and one that's commonly um, referenced is one that's called MERV-16, okay? So a US standard, yeah? Um, now, even in their literature, they say it's 50 times less effective than HEPA. Okay, difference in cost is about 50 bucks. Yeah, so um, what I like to say to people is look, at the end of the day, you're working on this quarry, this mine site, your son or daughter decides that they want to be an operator. Would you rather they were in a, Merv, uh, a cabin with a MERV um, 16 filter or a HEPA H 1314? Yeah, most people usually come back straight away and say, oh, look, I'd like the one that's 50 times better than the other one. Yeah, and I think that's where my 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 discussion comes in is look really you know we want to be aiming for 100 removal not aiming for oh we've done enough 
but I don't really know how much is left over. But if we're taking out all the really bigger stuff, yeah, um, like using non HEPA, but uh, like a high efficiency non non HEPA, like your E10s, um, you, look again, massive increase in air quality. I'm not I'm not disputing that. Yeah, massive increase in air quality. But really, at the end of the day. If you've gone through all the effort of, of putting a seat in the cab, putting the monitor and putting the pressure, um, the fresh air pressurizer research filtration in there, you, 50 bucks a service is one over the other is probably not even viable, you know? So well, I, I don't believe so. Uh, another question. Um, a P2 filter, yeah. uh, it's adequate for a respirator. Yeah. Um, what about the cabin filters? Okay, so P2 is essentially what they call that E10, which is 95% effective, okay? So when you start looking at your, your respirables, you're talking about protection factors of 10-ish, 10 and 15, yeah, um, with, 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 with one of these, okay? So if you really are looking at providing the, 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 the really best air quality available for your operator in that cabin, and then essentially they don't need these. Yeah, so when they're in the cab, they don't need to wear a mask, yeah? So we did a, a study for for um, a tunnel building company, should I say, yeah? Working out the cost of our system over the cost of using these, yeah? Our system worked out cheaper, yeah? So yes, you can use them and, and yeah, look, I, I think realistically, you know, if you're looking at RS20, that's not an option, yeah? So um, yeah, look, I'd, I'd like to say not. Uh, one question here I might ask a bit of a variation yeah. Bridget's is um, how does uh, wet environments um, affect the filtration? It's a really interesting question. I had this discussion the other day. Okay, so essentially one of the, the biggest issues where I was talking about saying there is look, we we talking at, when we're talking about looking at that image there with the dust level around the mine site, etc. Obviously, when you've got um, a wet incident, rain, high humidity, whatever it is, you're gonna damp down a lot of the dust. Okay, the problem is when I say damp down, that dust goes from the air to the ground, yeah? Now the operator then comes wandering along, yeah? Walks over all that beautifully damp down dust, yeah? And carries it straight up into the cab, yeah? So for a while, it'll sit there damp, yeah? But slowly as the operator sit inside the cab, those little damp worms will just drop out the shoe. They get dry by the air conditioning. So if it's cool, they'll put the heater on, yeah? And if it's hot, they'll have the heater, well, they have the air con on, but they might have the heater on as well for demisting, okay? So what you're doing there is you're drying all the air, right? And you're drying that, those little worms on the, of, of dust on the floor, right? Then what actually happens is as the operator's operating, you're grinding them up, yeah? You'll see in one of my slides there, I showed the sort of the vent at the floor level, <laughs> blown up into the uh, breathing zone. So the fact that you're working in a wet environment, I, I'd love for somebody to do a study to say, is there any difference? I'll, I'll bet my bomb dollar there's probably about a 5% difference between a wet env a, testing a cabin in a wet environment and a dry environment, yeah? Um, because essentially, don't get me wrong, the filter on the pressurizer probably lasts way longer because you've got low, way lower dust load. Um, but it's one of the things that, look, I, I found out in Canada the hard way is essentially dust season in Canada is actually the middle of winter. Yeah, why is that? They can't use water to damp down, yeah, because it just turns to ice, so they can't spray. So essentially they're working in really, really dry environments, yeah, doing exactly what we do all day long here at our plus 30, 40, 50 degrees, yeah, but at minus 20 degrees, yeah. So the temperature isn't a factor, yeah. It, yes, the humidity will make some changes, but temperature is not a factor. So if you go up into the oil sands of Canada in the middle of winter, believe me, it is so dusty. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for the presentation, Nick. It's been very uh, informative. Um, I'd just like to thank everyone for um, having a look today and I uh, uh, hope you all have a safe week. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for your time. Any questions, just click us an email. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you.